Hi everybody and welcome to today's Cambridge University Press ELT webinar on motivating teenage ELT students while studying abroad. I'm Will and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, also, just so you know, the recording of today's webinar will be on our blog uh, and also on YouTube very soon. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce your host for today. Uh, he holds a PhD in ELT pedagogy, pedagogy was Professor of English at the Teacher Training University of Graz, Austria, and is well-known plenary speaker at numerous international conferences. He was also president of IATEFL, the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language. For more than three decades, he's done research into the practical application of, finding, of findings from cognitive psychology and brain research to the teaching of English as a foreign language and has co-authored numerous course books, as well as articles and resource books, including Think for Teens and Empower for Adults and Young Adults. It is, of course, Mr. Herbert Pukcha. Welcome, Herbert, and over to you. Thank you, Will, and welcome to this webinar on teaching teenagers. This session is mainly, but not exclusively, for colleagues who teach students from different countries and backgrounds students who've come to take a course in an English um, speaking country in order to develop their competence in English. Of course, these students may be attending their course for other reasons as well. They may hope to achieve better results in English at school on returning to their home country. They may hope to enhance their career opportunities, or they might want to prepare for an important exam that will decide uh, their future university options. Or they may just want to have a good time while learning to communicate better on a course abroad, enjoying the many advantages and opportunities offered, such as meeting young people from other countries and exploring what the new environment has to offer in terms of cross-cultural experiences. A stay abroad in an English speaking country offers plenty of opportunities for students to develop their language competence outside the classroom, of course. And they won't be able to enjoy, um, sorry, they, they will not only be able to enjoy the rich natural language learning opportunities that are available through social programs, cultural events, sports and project activities, but they will also be able to see the progress they're making by using English as a natural means of communication with others from different L1 backgrounds. As valuable, efficient and important as these out of classroom learning opportunities are, in this webinar, we'll be focusing on the classroom. But a classroom may arouse memories that are not associated with being highly motivated, as far as some of your students are concerned, at least. Hence, I believe that it's well worth looking at some key aspects of what can be done to motivate those students. So here goes with an overview of what we will cover in this um, session. Motivation is probably the single most important psychological factor governing how well our students learn and indeed whether they learn at all. For many people, motivation is closely related to being rewarded. So this is the first area we'll be looking at. Um, Research has shown that incentives and rewards often don't achieve the outcomes we hope to achieve in our classroom. Uh, so I'd first of all like to suggest that we take a look at motivational research carried out in non-educational settings to see what we as teachers can learn from that. Secondly, I'd like to look at praise, incentives and rewards from the point of view of neurosciences, neurobiology uh, to be precise, and focus what's called the brain's own, um, focus on what's called the brain's own reward system. 
Thirdly, I should like to look at key principles of motivating um, teenage ELT students. And finally, uh, present some practical implications of all those insights and make suggestions for the teenage classroom using examples from uh, my course book for teenage students, Think, that I have co-written uh, with Jeff Stranks and Peter Lewis Jones. Let me start with some thoughts on motivation and rewards. There's a TED talk um, by Dan Pink worth watching where he elaborates on the puzzle of motivation in the world of business. He starts out by quoting an experiment that was first carried out by Carl Dunker as early as the 1950s the so-called candle problem. In that experiment, the participants were led into a room where they saw a table with these objects on it, a candle, some matches, and a box full of drawing pins. They were given the task of fixing the candle to the wall in such a way that the wax didn't drip onto the table if they lit the candle. Well, most of the participants started by trying to tack the candle to the wall in some way using the drawing pins, which of course didn't work. A few others tried to light the candle first and use the melting wax to stick the candle to the wall, but this doesn't work either. Finally, a few of the participants discovered that in order to do the task successfully, they had to use the box in a different way, not as a container for the drawing uh, pins. Here is a photo of the uh, solution. What we can learn from this is that in order to do what they'd been asked, the participants had to overcome what Dunker calls the functional fixedness with the different objects used in the experiment. For most people, a box is a box. And so it's used as a container, as in this case, to hold the drawing pins. So only those participants who managed to overcome this fixed idea and, pun intended, managed to think literally outside the box, managed to solve the task. This candle problem was used later by a psychologist called Sam Glucksberg uh, when uh, doing research into how incentives influence people's performance. In this experiment, one group of participants were not offered any incentives at all. They were simply told by the researchers that they were interested in finding out what the average time for doing the experiment was. The control group, so group two in this case, um, uh, were offered uh, cash incentives for doing the task quickly. People were told they could win what would today be approximately $40 if they were among the top 25% in terms of uh, finishing time. And a prize of about $160 was promised to the person who finished fastest. The results were fascinating and quite surprising. The group who'd been promised the cash incentives were three and a half minutes slower on average than the group who'd, been, uh, who'd not been incentivized at all. It's quite amazing, isn't it? And goes against the grain of what most people would have believed. Then uh, Glucksberg uh, changed the experiment. The task was the same, but this time the, the drawing pins were outside the box, so it looked um, like this. Again, one group of participants weren't given any incentives at all, whereas the control group were promised money for being fast. But you know what? This time, the group who'd been promised the incentives actually won. They were clearly faster than the group who had not been promised any incentives for doing the task 
fast. How is this possible? Um, we may ask ourselves. Well, the explanation um, that Jagsburg gives is that this time in the participants' perception, the box wasn't fixed in their minds as the container for the drawing pins. So the task was much more straightforward than when the tags were in the box, uh, which required more creative out of out of the box thinking. Dan Pink quotes uh, several other studies that have been carried out in recent years that all confirm what Gagsberg found. Again, people were given tasks and promised, in promised incentives, and um, here's the outcome. Um, as long as the task involved only mechanical skills, bonuses worked as they would be expected. The, the higher the pay, the better the performance. But once the task called for even rudimentary cognitive skill, a larger reward led to poorer performance. That's fascinating, I believe, and one wonders what the relevance of these insights are for the classroom. On the whole, I think it's fair to say that most teachers use rewards too. Of course, not cash incentives, but other things. In fact, um, the idea of rewards in education is usually associated with two images, the carrot and the stick. A traditional view of this would be that as teachers, we give carrots for anything that pleases us. For example, a student has successfully learned the new words in a chapter we are teaching, has achieved good results in a test, or has done their homework well. So what we do is we reward them for that. The carrots we hand out can come in all shapes and sizes, gold stars, smiley faces, stickers, praise, good grades, certificates, what have you, depending on the student's age and other factors. There's the opposite of all those rewards too, the educational sticks that we hate to use, but sometimes feel we have to resort to when students don't behave well, don't study what they're supposed to be studying, etc. The key point here seems that um, uh, when we use rewards, we reward what we as teachers find pleasant. And this is where we get uh, pretty clear warnings from neurosciences that rewards of that kind can achieve pretty much the exact opposite of what we want uh, to achieve. We'll look into the reasons for this a bit later. Giving rewards for behavior that we like can work well, but not with students and not when we want them to do co cognitively challenging tasks, such as learning another language. Rewards work with dogs, dolphins, and pigeons, but unless we see ourselves as animal trainers, what we need to do is look a bit deeper into the brain to find out more about the most natural way our students can reward themselves. But let's hold off uh, from this for a few minutes. Let's uh, first of all look at the what is called the emotion centers um, of the brain. I guess um, we all agree that, that our students' emotions play a key role in their learning. The brain has two very basic emotional systems, a negative one and a positive one. We're all familiar with the effects of these emotional systems uh, on our students' um, behavior and how they even influence uh, their, their body language. I mean, here just uh, two examples of, of um, students in their, in their learning environments, and we can see which of the two um, systems is at work in each, in each um, photo. These emotion systems belong to the oldest structures of the human brain from an evolutionary point of view. Positive emotions come from the pleasure system, which is a want system. 
negative emotions come from the fear system, which is an avoid one. We eat ice cream for the first time when we are young, and that's enough to make most of us want more of it. We get burned when we touch a candle for the first time and learn from that, that we need to avoid flames so we don't suffer pain. Learning to identify what we need to have more of and what we need to avoid is actually crucial to our continued survival. This is powerful learning and the punishment reward system has evolved in the brain as a consequence, manifested as a sense of fear or a sense of pleasure. The system is so deeply buried within the brain that it forms part of our instinctive inheritance, hence is not easily influenced by rational or conscious thoughts and ideas. The fear system sends out stop signals. The pleasure system sends out go signals. It wants us to get more of something. It wants us to get closer to or to get more of what causes pleasure. It's the most powerful and important reflex we have for survival. Interestingly, the pleasure system is older than the fear system. Otherwise, the human race wouldn't have survived, if you know what I mean. Behind those emotions, there are biochemical processes and they are varied. They're caused by the release of certain chemicals. Among um, the ones that activate our pleasure system are um, mainly uh, dopamine, but also adrenaline and serotonin. Dopamine is connected with pleasure and action. Adrenaline causes tension and excitement and serotonin, peace and tranquility. So we can say that the pleasure system is the brain's own reward center. But what does that mean? Making sure our students have enough fun. Is that all we need to do uh, as teachers? Well, actually, it's not that easy because what we're talking about here is learning uh, in the sense of higher order cognitive activity, such as language learning. This process requires more sophisticated brain functions than wanting ice cream or avoiding heat. And this is where external awards, uh, rewards, sorry, normally don't work so well, as we saw from the candle experiment. And what we've seen in a business context is very much the same in education. External incentives narrow our students' thinking. Using a simple if-then approach, if you do this well, then you'll get whatever, um, uh, means that students mainly focus on the reward, not on the task. That's no problem in a mechanistic kind of task, but when their mind is narrowed in that way, their brain is unable to think creatively and engage in the lateral thinking required for higher order cognitive tasks, such as language learning. I, I guess we all agree that learning a foreign language is not a mechanical routine, a simple stimulus response behavioral learning process. So in view of the experimental results, it won't come as a surprise to you that rewards don't work in the same way as they do in animal training. We need to uh, look at successful foreign language learners people like us, really, I guess, um, I guess we all have experienced the joy we can get from communicating in a foreign language successfully the first time. And then time and time again, we can see that learning a foreign language successfully is a, a highly sophisticated cognitive process and B, at the same time, when we succeed, it is, mark my words, a rewarding experience. The opposite can also happen, of course. Being a learner of a foreign language can be frustrating. And we are back with the two emotion centers of the brain. The pleasure system, which is also called the nucleus accumbens, and the fear system, uh, which is called the amygdala. I'd now like to suggest that we look at the principles 
of how the brain's reward system gets activated. These um, principles are important for two reasons. They help us understand better why intrinsic motivation is so much stronger than, intrins than, than extrinsic one, and they should, I believe, become our guidelines in our practical work. Remember, what we are talking about is the brain's internal pleasure system. But when it comes to foreign language learning, we're talking higher order brain function. And as I've said, uh, not just eating ice cream or chocolate. That's why the secret is not just making sure our students have fun all the time. The, the question for us is what makes the brain's own reward system tick? And here are the answers. First, um, neurobiologists tell us our brain rewards us for understanding. The way we can see this is that understanding contributes to our survival and hence gets rewarded and gives us a feeling of pleasure. So if a student um, gets challenged cognitively and they achieve well in the task, what happens is that the um, um, positive emotion center releases those emotion um, chemicals and they, they get this, this feeling of having achieved something. Not understanding can be frustrating and threatening and often activates our fear system. And let me stress again that an important insight for the teaching and learning context is that the, re that the brain rewards us for developing so-called higher cognitive functions. We'll be talking about the practical implications of this later. Second, the brain reacts to content that is relevant. In other words, content that is seen as important by the students themselves. If it's seen as important to the students' lives, uh, to their future lives, it's again perceived as contributing to their survival by the brain. And that's actually what the brain's interested in. We could say that importance is valued. Uh, we could say that importance is valued highly by the brain. And there's one reason for that. If students or their brains perceive the content of what they're learning as um, important, as relevant, they are more easily prepared to buy into it. They're more prepared to give something in order to get something. As, I, as I've mentioned, it's as if they're buying whatever it is that is important to them. And of course, what they need is to give um, um, attention as the metaphor of paying attention so beautifully and meaningfully suggests. Our roles as teachers in this process, as we'll see later, is to sell whatever we are doing as important to our student life, students' lives. Again, more about how we can do this a bit later. The third point is about who is in control. The brain needs to know that it's in control, otherwise there's no learning. Being in control is intimately tied up with student autonomy, and we'll talk about that later when we look at the concept of ownership. The fourth point is about action and movement. Learning and developing is about being active, about setting goals, and making an effort to achieve those goals. Not setting goals and the lack of engagement lead to boredom and inertia. Uh, the neurobiologist uh, James Zal offers a convincing model in line with current neuroscientific thinking. The model involves uh, two perceptions. Firstly, a, a present perception. So to give an example from uh, within a foreign language learning context. Let's assume I'm a student of English and my teacher has given me a creative writing task. I know um, my teacher um, uh, expects from me uh, to do this well, 
and I've got to do it. That's my present perception of the situation. Secondly, um, there's an image of the desired future state. In our example, this would be that I haven't started writing yet, but I can imagine what it'll be like to have written a good text. And I can, if I've had positive writing experiences before, probably imagine feelings of joy I'll get from creating a particularly original piece of text. Successful action requires making the connection between the present perception and the desired future state, which in turn requires, as we can see from this uh, chart here, an action plan of some sorts in the form of an idea or an image of what to do, which we can then carry out with the help of our action neurons, in our particular case, me activating my imagination so I can come up with ideas of what I want to write about. The argument here is that we get joy from successful goal-oriented action. And the reason why this is so valuable, I believe, is that brain research shows that we get joy and satisfaction not only from physical movement, such as taking exercise or doing some kind of creative work, such as painting, uh, painting a picture or cooking a meal, but also from imagined and what is called anticipated movement, such as getting up on a Sunday morning and planning a long walk I want to take, or to go back to, to the example uh, one more time, visualizing the joy I'm getting from having completed a creative piece of text I'm planning to write. So we have um, four key principles that we have to keep in mind when it comes to deciding on what uh, to do in our classroom when it comes to motivating uh, teenage um, students. The importance of understanding, the importance of relevant content, the importance of being in control, or the importance of students being in control rather, and the importance of goal-oriented action or anticipated movement and uh, I'd like to stress again that movement in this case is not only about um, physical uh, movement. When we read a good narrative, when we read a novel for example, we are constantly involved in a process of anticipated action. We, we are excited about where the story goes. We, we anticipate the the movement in the story. And this is what keeps us um, uh, reading a good book. This is also why extensive reading um, is so important in the, in the ELT classroom. This is why stories, narratives are so important, um, uh, also with teenage students. Uh, let's now have a look at um, uh, a number of practical uh, suggestions, as I said, uh, I'm going to be using a few examples from uh, uh, my course book with, uh, from Think, my course book with uh, Jeff Strax and um, Peter Lewis Jones. So what are the, the practical uh, classroom examples? Well, I would uh, think that um, very much in line with Earl Stevick's uh, famous saying that success in the foreign language class um, is, is not so much about uh, materials and, and um, uh, linguistic analysis uh, and, and also not so much about activities, but it's more about what's going on or what goes on um, inside of the student and between the people in the classroom. So, so my first point here is really about um, the, the classroom, what I call the classroom culture. We need to show our students, and I think this is the key point, that we take them seriously. Seriously, not just as learners, but as um, human beings. In a recent um, uh, Cambridge uh, book titled Meaningful Action, Earl Stevig's Influence on, on Language Teaching. It's a book edited, edited by, by Jane Arnold and Tim Murphy. Um, Scott Thornbury 
analyze is what factors optimally uh, support language learning. His article, The Learning Body, draws on a model of situated cognition and stresses the nature of language and language learning being about complex dynamical processes that go far beyond a system of mere language input, language output. Uh, Scott Thornbury quotes um, Robbins and um, I did um, saying that first cognition depends not just on the brain, but also on the body. And this is the embodiment uh, thesis. Secondly, um, cognitive activity routinely exploits structure in the natural and social environment, the embedding thesis, the importance of, of uh, the, the social interaction in the classroom. And third, the boundaries of cognition extend beyond the boundaries of individual organisms. And uh, this is um, uh, what um, uh, Scott Thornbury also stresses as language learning as an extended uh, process. It's the extension thesis. So, so what does, how can we break this down um, to, to practical classroom work? What does a classroom look like where the teacher takes her teen students um, seriously, um, actually. Um, so, um, let's look into a classroom where this, this multimodality and, and, and where these three qualities embodied, embedded and extended organically dovetail into, into one another. Uh, the extract that I'm going to uh, present is from a teenage class of 13 and 14 year old intermediate students. Uh, the teacher, so this is a transcript of a recording from parts of the lesson. And the, the teacher had used an activity that I developed a while ago together with Maria Rimbalukri, an activity we called speculating. Uh, the teacher asked the students to write down three sentences about a partner that were speculations about that person, but not to share those speculations yet. Student A in each pair were asked to put their notes face down on the desk in front of them, close their eyes and listen. Student B would slowly read their speculations to student A, pausing a short while after each statement uh, to allow A to reflect on their thoughts and feelings about their partner's uh, speculations. When all the three statements had been read out uh, that way, the A's were asked to open their eyes and note down their thoughts. Then A and B swapped roles. When the students had finished reading out their speculations to each other, the teacher gave them a few minutes, still in pairs, to share their thoughts during the experience before asking them uh, to do a, a PMI, note-taking activity, in which they wrote down what they liked. So the P stands for positive, what they didn't like, the M in PMI stands for minus, and what they found interesting, I stands for interesting. What then followed was a whole class discussion. And um, here's a short extract um, from it. This is uh, obviously um, uh, copied verbatim. So we have student one saying, it's fascinating. Listen to someone saying something about you when your eyes are not open. Teacher, why is that? Student, I don't know. Maybe when I don't look at a person, not look in their eyes, I'm more, um, and here the student uh, uses his hands and, and makes a, a kind of vertical movement of both hands in front of their face and, and chest with, with their palms um, uh, directing, uh, showing inwards. 
and the teacher says teacher offers a word for this so the teacher puts um, um, themselves in the in the students shoes so to speak and, and and guesses what the students might might want to say focused and mirrors the student's hand movement the student says yes focused focused is so the student says yes focused but it's not absolutely sure and asks the teacher says says focused is and the teacher says concentrated oh yes concentrated i think this is true more concentrated focused yes that's right and student two butts in and says for me it was a feeling of um and gestures pointing at her own head then at the students next to her it says like to know what's what's going on in maria's head hmm understanding the other person uh um intuitively and the teacher repeats the gesture yes exactly it's interesting sometimes i know very good what someone is thinking and student three says me too thinking or feeling is this helpful the teacher wants to know yes helpful very helpful when you know what someone is thinking you can help them you can understand them better it's good for for friendship good for give a person the feeling that you like the person but not always it's it's, it's not always good sometimes i think I know what another person thinks, but it's not true. It's it's just I'm thinking it, not their thinking. It's my thinking. Student, well, I don't know. Maybe when I don't look at a person, not look look in their eyes, I'm more um, teacher again focused. Yes, focused. Oh, sorry, this, I'm, I'm going back to the to the first um, uh, slide here. Okay, so so the, I'm, I apologize for this. This slide actually should go. So it's it, these two slides um we were we were looking at here okay so galbert um actually um says about such um um examples of classroom discourse where students are really taken seriously that what's actually characteristic of them is that sequences are initiated by trials in both uh, speech and gesture. We can see how important gesture is um, uh, in this example, followed by other repetition, often leading to overlapping synchronized speech and gesture, following by new repetitions by learners during integration, occasionally followed by further repetition of the initial sequence. We can see here that, um, uh, uh, for example, when um, the student first doesn't know um, uh, this word and then uses this vert vertical movement of both hands, that the teacher actually mirrors the student's hand movement. And later on, the student uses the same mirroring uh, uh, gesture in order to ask the teacher again, um, uh, basically, uh, what that word um, was. So typically, Galberg says, interlocutors repeat both gestures and speech until, until both parties are satisfied that a common understanding has been reached. And Galberg, uh, Marian Galberg, continues by saying, just like native speakers, learners are keen to keep the floor, to save face, and so on. And just like native speakers, they prefer to find solutions to the problems without interrupting fluency if possible and without overtly appealing for help. However, self-repair, as we know, <laughs> as teachers of, of ELT students, will often be impossible for learners, even when they do manage to find the circumlocution or approximation. And learners, therefore, often must resort to interactive multimodal solutions that's when they use their hands and feet to express something and that's where the teachers um, um, ability to um, actually have empathy with the students to 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 guess what the students might want to say and offer this as a suggestion to the student um, uh, comes in um, and is so uh, important actually in think we have um, activities, a, a wide range of um, activities in um, every unit, really, which are labeled think self-esteem, 
um, and also um, think values. I don't have an example of value activity here. Well, these these activities um, have proven um, to be um, excellent at stimulating this kind of classroom discourse where students really um, um, say what they want to say. This is an example. I mean, every student wants to be happy, don't they? Um, students, first of all, read these statements. They are, they're supposed to tick the ones that they think are important for being happy, or, or they cross out uh, or they write across against the ones that they think are not so important. And the statements are, for example, there's no right body shape or size. Healthy and happy people come in all shapes and sizes. Students think about this and either tick or cross. You can only find out what kind of person someone is if you get to know them better. Never laugh about people for being too thin, too short, too tall, or too fat. So students look at this, they think about these statements, and they, they note down um, their first reaction. And then they work in pairs first, and they discuss what they think is important for being happy. And this can be followed up by a whole group discussion where, again, there is, of course, no right or wrong. Um, uh, there, is, uh, there is only um, opinions. Students say what they think, and the teacher um, um, uh, shows students that they actually take seriously um, the students' um, thinking. The second point is about content, about relevant content. The question is, of course, what, what kind of content is relevant for, for students, for, for teenage students? Um, I, I'd like to stress again, I've said this already, that I think um, content that teenagers are really interested in, they find really fascinating, is not, as some people often assume, content that is about celebrities and the glitz and gamma of the, of the film and pop industry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, students often um, become a lot more engaged, both in, in, in emotional and cognitive ways, if we offer them content that uh, is real, so real world content, content about people who've done something uh, that is extraordinary, heroes and, and heroines, everyday heroes and heroines, um, content that's related to other countries, other cultures, and also content which is about um, life situations that are very, very different from our students' own um, uh, life situations. This is an example from uh, Think. Um, it's, it's a unit about the wonders of the world. And um, we start out here uh, with a text on, on one of the most fascinating, uh, but also most dangerous um, uh, places uh, uh, of this world, and this is the Kalahari uh, Desert. So after, you know, getting students to look at the photos here and uh, talking about the animals in the, in the pictures, brainstorming um, other animals students know, activating their, their prior knowledge, thinking about uh, exotic animals and, and um, which countries those those animals are from. Um, students look at the at the pictures again and they talk about um, um, what might be dangerous about about uh, the place uh, shown in these in these photos. But at the same time also what might be fascinating, why people might want to to visit um, uh, this place. They read the text then, and 
Um, the text is, is obviously about why this is such a dangerous place. Um, it's one of the, the, the world's hottest places. It doesn't, um, during the summer months, uh, several months where, where there's no rain. But there are people, there's still a few uh, tribes, the, the, the San people who, who live in the, in the Kalahari Desert. And, and obviously these people have um, uh, fascinating um, uh, insights into um, uh, medicinal plants and, and how they can survive in, in, under these extreme um, uh, life conditions. As you can see, this is followed up by a values activity, which is about valuing our, our world. So again, students talk about um, uh, their own um, thoughts and their opinions and, and, and feelings here. We go on um, talking about, this is uh, talking about grammar, comparative adjectives, relating that back to what the students have read in an inductive way. And then um, uh, there's the introduction of, of a lexical set, geographical features. Before students actually um, look at these photos here on, on the next page uh, with the listening activity, and they match um, the photos um, with, the, with the words here. It's about uh, an antelope and, and a, a lion with its kill. It's about a spear and, and uh, some uh, vultures. And then they, they actually um, listen to um, a recording. I, I, I record it. I, I just like to, if you don't mind, tell this anecdote. I'm a, a dedicated wildlife photographer myself, and actually there's there are a few of my photos here in this unit. Um, and I actually recorded, I had the, the, the pleasure and the privilege when on a photo safari in the Kalahari Desert, um, I, I actually had an opportunity to uh, interview um, a San uh, tribesman. He, he worked as a tracker uh, in one of those safari places, and he, he spoke very good English. And and um, I actually asked him, and I recorded this interview, what it was like to grow up, uh, what it was like for him as a teenager to grow up in the in the Kalahari. And it was fascinating because the first thing he said was that he started to laugh, and I said, "Why are you laughing?" And he said, "Well, you know, I'm just thinking." Um, um, you know, when I was a teenager and I wanted, I, I got to know my, my wife and I wanted to, to marry her. When you, when you um, uh, get to know uh, someone and, and, and you want to, to marry this, this woman, you have to go and ask um, uh, the, the girl's uh, father. And, and he said, and, and the father will give you, the father needs to know that you're courageous because if you don't have courage, you can't protect your family. So he needs to know that you are a courageous person and he gives you um, a number of tasks. And um, he actually um, uh, told me about a number of those tasks. The, the recording was, was uh, more than 90 minutes. So what we did was we transcribed this interview and we, we actually, um, um, uh, focused on one of those tasks, and this is um, the the recording. I hope that this um, audio is going to work. No, it's not working. Oh, that's a pity. Uh, so let me let me quickly tell you. So basically, what this um, um, some tribesman actually said. His name was um, PK, and he said, uh, you know. So I I went to the girl's father, and I, I told him that that I want to, to, to marry your daughter. And he gave me three tasks. And the first task was, um, you have to take away a kill from a lion. And he said, well, you know, in order to take a kill from a lion, you, you, you have to know how to do that. First of all, you have to find the lion with its kill. So I said, how did you do that? And he said, well, you, you, you look where, where the big birds are, where the vultures are. So when you see the vultures circling in the, in the sky, uh, most probably um, they are circling above a lion that has a kill there because they want to to get some of the food. 
um, then you have to to find the lion, he says, and and you have to actually chase the lion away. But you must never do that uh, during the night. During the night, lions can 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 run extremely fast. You have to do that during the day. So I said, how do you do that? He said, well, you 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 actually you you go up to to the lion, you tiptoe up to the lion. And you you try um, to to remain uh, you know um, um, unseen by the lion for some time, and you 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 actually you take your spear. And I said, well, do you, are you going to attack the the lion? He said, no, no, no. You must never never attack it. You must never kill it. But you must shock the lion. So you must jump at it, and you must actually shout at the lion. So the lion will run away. The lions uh, during the daytime because they don't have sweat pores. The big cats don't have sweat pores, so their body doesn't um, cool down um, during the day. While a human's uh, body, obviously, because we sweat, uh, cools down. That's why we can run fast, but lions can't. So the lion will actually leave their their kill, their prey, and they will go away when you when you shock them. So so that's the 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 listening. I'm I'm sorry, I couldn't actually play the authentic um, listening to you. This would be another um, example of a text that students find, uh, we've seen that in our trial classes, find extremely fascinating. Uh, this is um, um, a text that is based on uh, James Zoll's uh, research about what learning does to the human brain, that, that successful learning is actually about um, uh, brain change and and what happens when somebody learns successfully is that certain hormones get released in our neocortex and the neocortex changes and this is how we remember things this is how our memory um, gets improved and how we how we learn and, and what we're actually saying to students is the more you can actually um, 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 be emotionally engaged in your learning, the more you can you can um, see learning as a meaningful activity, the better this process will actually work in the brain and the more easily you will learn and and the longer and better you will you will actually remember. So so much about um, using relevant content. The third point is about challenging um, students. But not not too much. Students need to develop an awareness of achievement. Nothing succeeds like success. Uh, neurobiologist uh, James Zal actually um, says, uh, and for that, the right level of challenge is important. Not challenging students enough creates boredom, while challenging them too much generates feelings of frustration. Uh, we, we do need to challenge students cognitively, though, as the brain, as we've said previously, rewards understanding. In THINK, we have a range of activities, actually, um, throughout all the, the levels from A1 up to C1, that are aimed at developing students' uh, cognition, that are aimed at developing their critical thinking, in this case here, uh, what we have is um, students are asked um, to, they first listen to a talk, a student's talk. Um, they complete these two gapped sentences here um, with therefore and should. And then um, the teacher helps them to understand the difference between valid and invalid conclusions. And we say a conclusion is only valid if it follows logically from the information given. If we need to make assumptions about facts that are not part of the information, then the conclusion is invalid. And we have uh, four tasks here, A, B, C, D. A starts uh, with most kinds of sports are good for your health. Car racing is a sport, therefore car racing is good for your health. Students think about this and then they tick 
whether this is a valid or an invalid conclusion. This is our example. It's obviously invalid when you look at the uh, the speech bubble down there underneath the the um, four tasks. It says the conclusion is in A is invalid. It's true that most kinds of sports are good for your health. It's also true that car racing is a sport, but it's not true that all sports are good for your health. The first sentence talk, talks about most kinds of sports, not all sports. So this kind of thinking, this kind of critical thinking helps students in particular also with their um, reading skills because they learn to pay attention to detail they learn to to read in between the lines. They learn to infer um, uh, meaning, uh, etc. Of course, when it comes to um, developing thinking skills, uh, we certainly also want to develop the students' creative thinking. In this case, um, uh, students first of all do a short writing task. Imagine people don't have to sleep anymore. Think about the questions down there and write as many sentences as you can in your notebook. And then they get together, they read their ideas out to each other and they discuss what they have the same and what's different. And then there is a whole class discussion uh, following uh, that. Um, the next point is about, is, it's again about the kind of classroom culture, if you like, the relationships. And what's very important is positive information feedback and that we help them to become aware of their, their learning uh, progress. This is um, an example from um, uh, his brilliant book, Classroom Management Techniques um, by Jim, Jim Wing, uh, sorry, Jim Scrivener, where he gives concrete examples of positive information feedback. So um, there's four examples here. Um, the teacher saying the, the, the text in blue, I saw you working really hard to find the answers, but I'm afraid these four are wrong. What help can I give you to make the task clearer? So the teacher is not just saying this is good or it's not so good. It's not good because you've made four mistake, mistakes. The teacher actually uh, um, gives them uh, very clear information feedback and uses it to say, well, let me help you. Let, tell me what, how I can help you. Or uh, I really enjoyed reading this story. The part about swimming made me laugh out loud. So the teacher um, shares with the student his or her own emotional uh, reaction to uh, a piece of text uh, the student has written. And the, 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 the second point I mentioned here was helping um, students become aware of their own learning progress. Uh, this is about making the student's achievement more visible by displaying texts generated by the students, using posters, wall charts, learning journals, diaries, learning blogs. And I would like to stress this, there is clear evidence that practice testing is the most efficient study strategy. Uh, I would suggest that we get our students to regularly use practice tests because that helps them to become aware of their learning progress. Um, two more points very briefly, we need to help them feel they have ownership over their uh, language and their language learning. James Zal, the neurobiologist again, no outside influence or force can cause a brain to learn. It'll decide on its own. Thus, one important rule for helping people learn is to help the learner feel they are in control. Obviously, um, we need to do this in small steps. Um, we need to, you know, if, if we want to give them choice, if we want to give them freedom, um, uh, we, need, we need to do, you know, take small steps, give them small choices first, give them either or choices. Do you want to do, uh, do you want to read this text first or do you want uh, X, Y, Z? Um, invite individual students to make choices um, on behalf of the class. But of course, ensure everyone in class gets their turn. 
to make get them to make bigger choices for example by offering the menu of the week or the menu of the day where students um, uh, can uh, pick and choose uh, in any order they want the tasks here and um, work through this uh, kind of like uh, menu and last but not least i would like to stress the importance um, of using incentives in a light-hearted way if we want to use rewards and incentives um, this is an extract from sultan Derne's motivational strategies in the language classroom he says in an ideal world students would need no incentives such as rewards because they would be driven by their inborn curiosity and the joy they gain from the learning process itself however you're not living or at least teaching in an ideal world. And in fact, many classrooms are becoming less and less ideal. This being the case, I think that rewards can const constitute powerful motivational tools, which would be a real luxury to ignore. And um, he goes on suggesting that we should by all means avoid if then. If you do this well, then I'll give you. We, sh we should let students choose occasionally. He himself says, don't take the rewards terribly seriously. Uh, for example, I've always used sweets or cookies very successfully with university students um, or adult learners who appreciated them, but also considered them uh, love. So here, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you have listened uh, attentively to the very end uh, <laughs> uh, is my surprise reward for you and I would like to thank you very much and wish you all the best with your teenage students thank you well thank you very much indeed Herbert uh, that was extremely interesting uh, I'm sure I speak to everyone who's listening when I say that was very informative very interesting and thank you very much for your time today uh, to all of you listening, uh, if you'd like any more information on any of the course Think that Herbert has mentioned throughout his throughout the webinar, please visit our website uh, cambridge.org forward slash think for the British English version or change it to American Think for the uh, American English version. Otherwise, thanks again, Herbert and everyone else. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.